Good morning, folks. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Uh, this is a meeting in which we are listening with regard to cumulative impacts. This is public comment number four. We want to welcome all of our participants to us, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, Commissioner Brett Ackerman has been running lead on the cumulative impacts public comment process. And with that, we will turn the meeting over to Commissioner Ackerman. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, especially appreciate the preparation that you've put uh, together for today's meeting. We do have a number of participants signed up today, and we actually have a hard stop today at noon. And so we'll need to wrap up by then. So we'll ask you to monitor the time in which you're speaking. We'll run a timer so that you can see it on the screen as you're speaking. And uh, each person will have three minutes. Um, this is the uh, last, as the Chair mentioned of our public listening sessions associated with a cumulative impact stakeholder uh, process. Um, cumulative impacts were discussed during the mission change rulemaking, and while several regulations were implemented that intended to reduce the cumulative impact of oil and gas development, during that process, the Commission committed to take a more focused look at cumulative impacts in the future, and that's what we're doing here today. We had a petition in, in December that was heard by the Commission uh, with regard to air and um, with with regard to air pollutants. And uh, at that time, the commission committed to conduct a stakeholder outreach process beginning in the first part of this year on the broader issue. And again, that's what we're doing here today. I think most of you are familiar that COGCC is the agency charged with managing oil and gas in Colorado. And I believe that most of you are familiar with the commissioners and with COGCC staff. But we do have a few other panel members that we would like to introduce in order to get started here. And uh, Mr. Ray, if you could please start and introduce yourself. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Aaron Ray. I'm Assistant Director for Energy Innovation of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources. I came to DNR from the National Conference of State Legislatures where I led the energy program there. I'm really excited to be able to hear your views today and appreciate being included in the listening session. Thank you. Thank you. And I, it might be my screen, but I don't see Natalie Eddy. Um, on the panel, I think it might be my screen. Are you there, Natalie? Hi, Commissioner. Hi, everyone. This is Natalie Eddy. I'm the Deputy Director for Policy with Environmental Health and Protection with CDPAG. Um, sorry, I'm not able to put my video on right now, but I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Not at all. We are thrilled to have you with us. And normally, Kate uh, Fury has been joining us as well. I do not see her uh, in the meeting, so somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But... Okay. Well, again, I um, wanted to talk just a little bit about procedure, but first I wanted to recognize uh, Director Murphy as well. We're grateful to have her uh, with us as well. I apologize, I'm dealing with a different screen than I normally am, and so it's a little harder for me. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so the panelists are here generally to listen to your points of view, but may ask you for any points of clarification related to your testimony afterwards. But uh, generally, we will just uh, listen and move to the next speaker. I wanted to remind everybody that this meeting is specifically to introduce cumulative impacts topics that you would like the Commission to consider during its cumulative impact stakeholder process. And if you'd like to comment on a specific OGDP or CAP or other issue, it would be helpful if your comments is given during the appropriate hearing. But again, if you believe the points you are raising are helpful to the cumulative impacts discussion, please feel free to share them. Uh, issues that will be considered in this process are issues that are within COGCC's purview and mission that are consistent with Senate Bill 181 and uh, those that are reasonably actionable in the end. And it's not the intent of these meetings to debate or discuss or argue for or refute the merits of any issues raised, but simply rather to ensure that there's an avenue to raise and describe those issues that are important to you and uh, that you would like to have included along with any substance around those issues that you would like to provide. As I mentioned, you'll have roughly three minutes for your principal presentation, and we will be recording this meeting. Uh, a couple of procedural matters. When you are, uh, we will have the sign-up list on the screen, so you'll be able to see when you are signed up. Thank you, Ms. Dickham, for making that available for us. <clears throat> and when it's time for you to speak, you'll receive a prompt from Zoom that essentially states you're elevated to panel status. You'll need to accept that prompt and, um, then it will be up to you whether or not you want to turn video on, but we will need you to unmute and turn your audio on. 
And uh, Ms. Hickam has told me it would also be helpful if you are speaking, if you're, if you're able to, if you have the capability to change your name in the uh, meeting so that it matches your name, or at least closely approximates your name on the sign up list, it will streamline for her and make it easier for her to elevate you to the panel. Wanted to remind everybody to please be respectful during your comments. Uh, personal attacks of others or allegations of negligence or malfeasance for those that have opinions or, or questions or issues different than yours are not appropriate or productive or effective in getting your issues included in this process. And so as such, I'd like to respectfully ask you to refrain from these types of statements as well as refrain from addressing, debating, or refuting points raised by other commenters. The time for debating the substance of those issues will come. At the end of each public comment, as I mentioned, panelists, uh, maybe maybe asking you for clarification, but we will likely just move to the next presenter. Uh, so with that, Ms. Hickam, I believe, has the list up. And it uh, looks like we have uh, Mr. Kirby Wynn as our first speaker. So if we can elevate him, please. And uh, Mr., uh, excuse me, Commissioner Ackerman, uh, Mr. Wynn is going to be joining us in just a moment. So while we wait for him to join, we can call on Mr. Francois Bergen. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Larson, appreciate that. Apologies, Ms. Hickam, could you make me a co-host and I'll be able to elevate Francois and... Yeah, just a moment. Thank you. Okay, it looks like I, I see. Oh, there we go. Do you see me? Uh, we uh, hear you for sure, but we just see a black screen. At least that's what I see. Okay. But that, that's just fine. You're, oh, now we've got you. Oh, wait. Do you have me now or not? We did, and then you went away. There we go. Now we've got you. Thank you. Take it away. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. i um, Francoise Bergen, and um, I sit on the city council for Aurora the city of Aurora. And I, I'm not even sure I'm in the right hearing because I, you mentioned earlier, um, if it's regarding the cap, that uh, the hearing would be during that um, appropriate time. I was asked by a constituent to basically advocate on behalf of them. Um, and this is regarding the Lowry, the Lowry Ranch cap, so it may be the wrong form. Um, but they wanted me to advocate for a technical advisory board, and I'm not even sure what that is. So that's what I'm here for, is uh, to see if that is something that happens and is possible um, regarding the Lowry Ranch cap. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here, and we appreciate your words. I see the uh, chair has unmuted himself and may have a comment for us. Yeah, and I could provide a, a brief comment. Um, the technical advisory review board was something that was in uh, part of SB 19181. Uh, the commission has not been asked to put together a technical review board. Um, Ms. Uh, Council Member Bergon, if, if you want to get in touch with me after this meeting, we can talk further about it. Um, okay. And you can reach me. My uh, email is online, as is my phone number. And I look forward to speaking with you about that. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you. We're so happy to have you here with us this morning and appreciate Thanks. you reaching out to us. Um, Ms. Larson or Ms. Hickam, have we uh, added Mr. Wynn yet? We are bringing Mr. Wynn in right now. Great. All right, Mr. Wynn, we see you. It looks like you're unmuted. Please uh, go right ahead whenever you're ready. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is Kirby Wynn. I'm the oil and gas liaison for Garfield County, Colorado. Uh, today, I'm uh, visiting with you all representing Garfield County and our 15 county 
eight municipality, Western and rural local government uh, coalition. Um, we host uh, most of the producing oil and gas wells uh, in Colorado, including more than uh, are currently producing in Well County, actually. Um, cumulative local social economic impact, we believe, should be considered alongside all other cumulative impacts. In many cases, one of the most important cumulative impacts that will most significantly affect the welfare of a nearby community is the substantial social economic benefit of the massive influx of tax and other revenue to fund health and human services, emergency response, hospitals, libraries, schools, water districts, and so on. The cumulative local social economic impact and, and welfare harm uh, that would be caused by denying an OGDP or a cap should be considered in the mix of what you're looking at, especially in areas where oil and gas revenue can account for a major, sometimes majority portion of special district and county services funding. Now, now to move on to air quality issues that you are hearing a lot about and give you our perspective. <clears throat> we ask you to please review the existing air quality emissions data thoroughly that's available before embarking on a rulemaking to supposedly address cumulative air impacts. Air Pollution Control Division has mountains of data dating back from several newly adopted rules in the last six or seven years. We believe the only responsible course if you're gonna wade into air, cumulative air impacts is to work closely with the agency and really earnestly look at those data. Even the Air Pollution Control Division hasn't really adequately looked at this millions and millions of dollars worth of data. We think that's a, a ripe data set for you to really thoughtfully look at before you jump into rulemaking. Uh, there's a massive, largely, as I said, untapped and underutilized pile of air quality data that has been required to be collected by APCD and AQCC regulations um, that we believe you should thoroughly evaluate before putting forth any draft rule, uh, proposed rule for rulemaking. We suggest the OGCC and Air Pollution Control Division have a lot of groundwork to accomplish. It's gonna take some time, but we think it's necessary for you to really do that first and not just listen to the loudest calls for immediate rulemaking, but have an informed rulemaking. We believe that requiring new air quality and other types of data collection is the easiest task that you will ever have. It's simple to say, go forth, collect this data, that's the regulation. But we also believe and understand responsible assessment of those data to inform what we do know and what we do not know about cumulative air and other impacts is gonna be the toughest task for you. And we suggest that should be your top priority to consider as your next steps before jumping into a, a new cumulative impact rulemaking. I'm gonna go a bit further in demonstrating why COGC needs to do a lot more interpretation and consultation with CDPHE and APCD before rulemaking. The following passages from Senate Bill 181. In consultation with the Department of Public Health and Environment, evaluate and address the potential cumulative impacts of oil and gas development. That speaks volumes in consultation with, and we have not personally seen and been able to demonstrate where you all have really consulted in that meaningful, deep way that you need to with your sister agency. Also, nothing in the article impairs or negates the authority of the Air Quality Control Commission to regulate pursuant to Article 7, Title 25, the emission of air pollutants from oil and gas. So we ask you to thoughtfully work with your sister agency and not try to overrun their authority, uh, trying to look at cumulative impacts. We think there's a place there for y'all to really partner. Now, looking at uh, your own statement of basis and purpose, um, you said Thank in your- you. The end Sorry of to interrupt, but just wanted to uh, note the timing there for you. Um, we'll certainly have you finish okay. up. Thank you so much. I apologize. I will wrap it up briefly. Your own statement of basis and purpose, uh, it mentions you already succeeded a lot of doing a lot of things you need to do in cumulative impacts of rules 303, 314, 423, 24, and 27, and 903. Um, we would also suggest that in consultation with CDPHE, the commission determined that further evaluation of cumulative air impacts and oil and gas development, this is in your SBP, would be particularly valuable for both agencies. It notes, you note in your own SBP that there's a great deal of information already available from many sources about air and climate impacts of oil and gas development and some information on cumulative impacts. But the commission determined that additional studies and evaluation are necessary to adopt appropriately tailored reg regulations to address those impacts. Please 
get the new studies and the new data. That's your next step. And I'd be last, I'd be remiss not to mention the graph that's on right behind me here. That's that clearly shows that's data from 2008 through 2022 clearly shows the improving air quality trends in Garfield County right through peak drilling and fracking and peak production phases. The existing air rules are already having a mass, a, a fantastic positive impact. Thank you very much. I apologize for going over. And thank you, Mr. Wynn. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your comments. We uh, appreciate uh, your time here this morning. Uh, next, we have Emily Baer. Hi there. Right. Assuming... It looks like you're off mute. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners and representatives from CDPHE and um, Mr. Ray. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Hearing from and considering the impacted public is so very important at this decision making table. My name is Emily Baer. I'm a trustee in the town of Erie and I am an impacted resident. I've spoken before this commission many times over the years, sharing my family's experiences of being impacted by oil and gas development near our home, my children's school, and being forced pooled. Our impacts are many, and I couldn't possibly share all of our experiences in these three minute increments. There are a few talk topics I wanna to address today, hearing from the impacted public, uh, defining cumulative impacts so that they can be quantified in a way that informs the approval and denial of permits, in collaboration with other agencies and departments. First, we have to recognize that stepping into onto these public platforms to share deeply personal impact stories of illness and injury, often about family members or children, often about the grief of losing someone to cancers and other illnesses requires a lot of courage and vulnerability. It opens people to a lot of scrutiny in the midst of that grief and vulnerability. I've been approached um, at nearly every venue I've ever shared our impact stories at and told that I'm a bad mom, why don't I just move, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm asking this working group to simultaneously elevate the voices and lived experiences of the impacted public while also providing shelter for them. Maybe that looks like offering a portal to share written comments specifically for that group uh, and doing outreach to meet them in their communities. Miss Eddy has experience with this um, and the EJ arm of the CDPHE could be a tremendous resource for outreach with the impacted community and citizen groups that already exist in these communities. Second, in October, the COGCC considered the Kozla East application just feet outside of Erie's town border. I asked the commission to delay consideration of that site until they had a method to account for the impacts we already suffer in this area. While the 300 series rulemaking recognized that cumulative impacts do indeed exist, it fell short of defining or quantifying those impacts or equipping this, the commission with a method to enforce or apply those cumulative impacts in the decision-making process. And rule 904's resulting CIDR provides an incomplete picture at best. This regulatory gap was on display in the approval of Kozla East in an area where CDPHE's EnviroScreen tool shows a score of 100 out of 100 for air toxics and 100 for proximity to oil and gas development. The definition of cumulative impacts is urgently needed and should include all of the pollution sources we experience cumulatively. Third, through this cumulative impacts process, please recognize and create a path for collaborating with other regulatory agencies. There's been a lot of emphasis in these listening sessions on the COGCC's purview and addressing cumulative impacts in a way that is actionable. This highlights the importance of working with other entities like the AQCC, APCD, the EJ arm of the CDPHE and others to understand the full picture of what communities are facing related to cumulative impacts and how approval or denial of permits will further impact those communities. I have found myself stuck in the regulatory gap that exists between agencies pointing fingers at one another, claiming they don't have regulatory authority to address concerns or help residents in the moments of our distress. And so the processes of maintenance and permits, et cetera, continue business as usual and our impacts continue unimpeded. Um, I apologize for going over time, but I thank you so much for, um, for these meetings, listening to the impacted public. 
And thank you, Ms. Barrett. Thank you for your suggestions and for being here with us this morning. Appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. Next, we can elevate Laurie Anderson. All right, Ms. Anderson, we can see you. Looks like you're off mute. So whenever you're ready, please proceed. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> My name is Lori Anderson and I am a council member in Broomfield representing residents who have been adversely impacted by residential fracking. During the petition for cumulative impacts rulemaking, many of us weighed in with valuable information on the many and varied impacts of oil and gas development. I appreciate your moving forward with these sessions to collect additional information and input. Since three minutes is not nearly enough time to cover all impacts, written comments from Broomfield City Council members were submitted. CC4CA also submitted comments and we would like to assure that all comments are made public. Following is a high level overview of impacts from my experience in Broomfield. Some residents chose to move away because they couldn't handle the cumulative impacts of development near their home. I will briefly call attention to the most significant impacts to the residents I represent. The air we breathe is the top of the list. Residents are concerned about both the short-term impacts like nosebleeds and respiratory issues, as well as the long-term impacts like the possibility of leukemia and asthma developing over time from exposure to a cocktail of hazardous air pollutants, increased particulate matter, and high ozone levels. Noise also makes the top of the list. The noise we experienced was not just a mundane hum, but the sound of what many described as a freight train or jet engine, including in the middle of the night, and resulted in residents being sleep deprived and anxious and stressed. The impact to Broomfield's future water reservoirs of concern, since it now has the 18 well Livingston pad sitting just uphill from its perimeter. Another impact is what we have termed community turmoil. This is meant to capture the community angst when landmen come knocking on doors trying to convince mineral owners to lease or be forced pooled, and families who face the highest burden of adverse impacts rightfully feeling anxious, angry, and helpless. Additional impacts include degradation of taxpayer-funded open space, safety concerns related to a steady stream of sand trucks on boulevards, safety related to accidents such as fires, explosions, and well blowouts, and so much more. The passage of SB 181 gave communities like Broomfield hope that these cumulative impacts would be addressed, but it has now been almost four years. Comprehensively understanding the impacts of oil and gas production and acting on them in measurable, quantifiable ways and doing so quickly is immensely important. An operator cannot simply state that the cumulative impacts are near negligible without supporting analysis based on real data. I ask that the Commission adopt rules, policies, or procedures that direct a thorough and robust cumulative impacts analysis process to not just evaluate how permitted operations contribute to environmental and public health harms, but also, most importantly, to address what actions are needed to minimize those impacts. Additionally, I believe the state must pause its review and approval of comprehensive area plans and oil and gas development plans until the Commission completes comprehensive cumulative impacts rules or policies. If not, the current and significant impacts on natural resources and public health will just continue to get worse. Enforceable conditions must be written into development permits to immediately reduce these impacts. Although the caps and OGDPs that the Commission continues to review and approve include cumulative impact analyses, they are not grounded in well-defined protocols. This adds to the unhealthy air our residents are breathing, ongoing safety concerns, and adds to the impacts of climate disruption. Please pause any review and approval of oil and gas development plans and caps. Um, until the cumulative impact rules are complete. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. We appreciate you being here with us today. Appreciate your comments. It looks like we have elevated Commissioner Lopez. Commissioner, we see you. Uh, it looks like you are on mute. And we are ready for you whenever you're ready. Thank you so much and good morning. Uh, my name is Felix Lopez, Los Angeles County Commissioner. Uh, my uh, statement is going to be around the uh, Raton Basin uh, gas production. So here in Los Angeles County, of course, you all know that we are home of the 42nd State Park. We have one of the largest uh, uh, big game corridors and habitat. The, uh, the water that is being produced from the uh, Raton Basin, uh, specifically uh, Evergreen Natural Resources, is one of the uh, best waters that is extracted anywhere. So I'm, calling, I'm coming to you today with a request to consider uh, allowing the farming and ranching communities, as well as the wildlife, to maintain the water for usage of agriculture, as well as wildlife. 
the uh, the governor a couple of years ago um, had an opportunity to acquire the 42nd State Park, in a sense, the largest state park. And the migration of uh, wildlife creates uh, this corridor. And in order for this uh, wildlife to survive and stay alive and the, uh, the population to maintain the numbers, certainly the uh, produced water comes into a great, uh, of great importance. With the millions of gallons of water that is being extracted, it would be almost uh, an anomaly if we injected our water back into the uh, Raton Basin into the, just uh, to a point where the water is gonna be wasted. So certainly um, on behalf of uh, the uh, farmers and ranchers in Los Animas County that have enjoyed this water from the beginning of the uh, coal bed methane extraction here in Los Animas County, I would ask that you continue to work with CDPHG and take a look at the data that exists, the science supports, and certainly that this is one of the cleanest water that is being produced anywhere. And uh, hundreds of families here uh, basically uh, depend on that water to maintain their livestock, to maintain their uh, wildlife habitat. And so certainly uh, an opportunity for us to work together and create this collaborative partnership where the uh, filtration system is, is one of the most sophisticated ones. And I would imagine that all of you have had an opportunity to visit the uh, producers' uh, filtration systems. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had an opportunity to, uh, to travel with Evergreen Natural Resources as the, uh, the local operator and looking at some of the ex points of extraction and looked at the very, very uh, responsible filtration, i.e. Uh, uh, purification systems that they have, and this water flows into ponds and where the ecosystem, where the fish are thriving very good and the uh, the wetlands are really thriving with, with the water that is being extracted. So thank you so much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. And I invite you to come to Los Animas County and arrange a tour with our producer. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Commissioner Lopez. I appreciate uh, seeing you here this morning. Thank you so much for your time. Likewise, Mr. Uh, Ackerman. Uh, great to see you as well. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. All right. Next, uh, I believe we have Commissioner Pinter. And boy, we're getting efficient here. It looks like we've got you up already and ready to go. Commissioner, please uh, continue whenever you're ready. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I am Commissioner Emma Pinter. I am from Adams County. I am here testifying on my own behalf today, but I wanted to call attention to uh, a letter that was submitted by my team um, on February 3rd. You all should have a copy of it from the staff at Adams County. Really, this has been important to all of us um, in Adams County. It's something that's really important to my residents. And over the past three years since 181 was passed, and this commission has made incremental progress in complying with the 181 cumulative impact directives. Those efforts fall short in addressing the urgency responding to the twin crises facing Colorado, the climate crisis and the ozone crisis facing the North Front Range, my residents, and beyond the whole region. We urge this commission to initiate rulemaking as soon as possible to adopt permit conditions that prevent further harm by oil and gas development to our precious environment, to the disproportionately impacted communities that have borne the brunt of those impacts. We must simultaneously put rules in place and collect data. The team in Adams County was really uh, diligent in putting together several recommendations in this February 3rd letter, just to highlight um, the first one. Currently, an evaluation of existing permitted pollutant sources within a radius of each oil and gas development plan is not required by the rule. Such cumulative impacts to air quality during all phases of OGDP development can be assessed, and our county recommends the following measures. And we go through a, a detail list of affected pollutant sources, and we wanted to make sure that we are highlighting uh, the different ways that we could be more technical in gathering this information because it's such a harm to community to not realize the cumulative impact and the literal meaning of those words, not just the rulemaking. Uh, we want to make sure that um, while methane emissions are provided by the operator on the Form 2B, there is no evaluation of how such emissions impact for the progress to attaining greenhouse gas emission reduction milestones. And we have some recommendations on how to make sure that we are following the fidelity, the intent of the methane reduction. 
And we wanted to make sure that all of these uh, baseline and thresholds that are established for impacted categories um, are part of the cumulative impacts and that the net impacts of the 2020 COGCC report for the OGDP permitted in 2021 focus solely on physical infrastructure and land surface development, which indicates that the evaluation of all impacts in these categories is insufficient to determine true cumulative impacts. And so we had some recommendations for clarity, specificity for protecting air resources, public health, and water resources. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were communicating in detail because we know that this is really important and it's technical. But um, as I had said earlier, that twin crisis of needing to get regulations in place while still experiencing harm is really bearing down on our community. And we appreciate that you're taking this very seriously. Thank you so much, Commissioner Pinter. And thank you for submitting written comments as well. We really appreciate that. It's very helpful for us. Okay, next we have Mr. Juan Marcano from Leonora. And um, Commissioner Ackerman, I do not see Council Member Marcano in the meeting. If you are in the meeting and could raise your hand, we will elevate you as soon as possible. In the interim, we can hear from Mr. Eric Hudick. Let's please do. Thank you, Hearings Manager Larson. Can you hear and see me? We sure have got you, Mr. Hodek. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Eric Hodek with Ramball U.S. Consulting, uh, and I'm here today providing comment on behalf of Weld County specific to the cumulative air impact analysis. Uh, I am an air quality permitting and compliance professional with more than two decades of experience in the quantification, evaluation, permitting, and regulation of criteria air pollutants, air toxics, and greenhouse gases under federal and state programs here in Colorado and 17 other states. In addition, I have conducted cumulative air quality impact analyses for very large oil and gas projects under the National Environmental Policy Act, including resource management plans and project-specific environmental impact statements for large oil and gas plays across the country. As an experienced expert in this field, I'm here to say that the cumulative analysis that is contemplated is unnecessary given the extensive regulatory programs governing emissions and air quality impacts of the oil and gas industry, both at the state and federal level. The Air Pollution Control Division already administers programs delegated under the Clean Air Act to address the cumulative impacts of stationary oil and gas sources. The division already requires operators to conduct extensive evaluations of their emissions, employ best available controls, and demonstrate compliance through modeling with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, a cumulative standard to obtain an authorization to construct. <clears throat> Under federal standards enforced by the division, oil and gas sources undergo a rigorous risk and technology review and are required to implement maximum control of hazardous air pollutants. Further, oil and gas sources are subject to extensive regional studies by the Regional Air Quality Control Commission, which include projected growth and cumulative impacts to identify control strategies to be implemented by the division. Further, there have been more air quality regulations put forth to address the cumulative concerns from this industry, including air toxics monitoring, greenhouse gas reductions per the greenhouse gas roadmap, and ozone mitigation. The list is too long to enumerate in the limited time here. What more could this commission require as a result of cumulative analysis that is not already enacted or contemplated by the division or the Air Quality Control Commission? A cumulative analysis as contemplated requires highly skilled professionals with years of specific experience in scoping, design, and execution of complex analyses involving stakeholders in government, community, and industry. The agencies that oversee such studies at the federal level, such as BLM, Park Service, and even NASA, have dedicated departments with specialized staff who prepare environmental assessments and impact statements to support records of decision for programmatic resource plans involving multiple operators, 
even after 50 years of NEPA administration, these departments take anywhere from three years to decades to prepare such analyses. If the COGCC were to proceed, they would need to expand staff significantly to include not just air quality scientists and modelers, but imp tenured impact assessment professionals to administer the program. So I urge the commission to thoughtfully consider the magnitude of the undertaking of, the, of, of this mission to conduct such analyses. The requirement for cumulative analysis is already met by the extensive regulatory programs enacted. Additional efforts by this commission would not be an effective use of limited resources and add un additional and unnecessary regulatory burden to operators. And we urge the commission to defer this analysis to the division who has al already has both the purview and the exert expertise to fulfill this requirement effectively and efficiently. Thank you and I apologize for going over my time. Thank you, Mr. Hodek, and thank you for being cognizant of the clock. We appreciate that. Appreciate your comments here this morning. Next, we have Mr. Jeffrey Moore from the City of Aurora. Hello, Mr. Moore. We've got you, and I can see you. So please continue when you're ready. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Jeffrey Moore, and I am the manager of the oil and gas division for the City of Aurora. I was also recently invited to serve as a local government representative on the Midstream Steering Committee of CDPHE. I first want to thank you for your past efforts to address cumulative impacts and previous rulemaking. It is an important topic and the efforts that you have begun are moving Colorado in the right direction. I believe the comprehensive area plan or CAP concept has been helpful in gaining a clearer perspective on total emissions and cumulative impacts in an area. Currently in Aurora, we have a variety of oil and gas operations. We have 130 producing wells operated by uh, Civitas Resources. We also have a single KP Kaufman well, an orphaned well, an orphaned well site, a central gathering facility, a gas-fired electricity generation plant, a natural gas gathering system, and a crude oil gathering system. Just outside the city limits of Aurora, we are surrounded by Adams County and Arapahoe County. And these counties directly offsetting the city limits are additional producing wells, shut-in wells, orphan wells, other gathering systems, two compressor stations, and a gas processing plant. In most cases, these features are within a few hundred feet of the city limits of Aurora. In some cases, these features are isolated on an island of unincorporated county land surrounded by city jurisdiction. We also have multiple examples where the closest neighborhood and residences to one of our well sites is outside the city limits, outside our jurisdiction. Sometimes operators have a choice of whether to place a well site inside the city limits or over the county line, which often has less restrictive regulations. My point in these statements is to demonstrate that impacts from oil and gas operations, especially air emissions and truck traffic, as two examples, easily cross jurisdictional boundaries. I believe that more needs to be done to understand cumulative impacts across jurisdictional boundaries. I recommend that the following items be considered in your process. First, that CAP applications should be contiguous. A CAP should not be allowed to contain multiple non-contiguous areas. Non-contiguous areas should be separated into multiple CAPs. Second, CAP application should contain cumulative impacts for all operators and all operations within a CAP boundary. Your current rules allow a second operator to place a surface location within another operator's CAP boundary, as long as they are targeting minerals outside the CAP boundary. I believe this ignores important contributions to cumulative impacts. Third, I encourage you to consider stronger requirements for operators to use pipelines for oil transportation and the use of electric rigs for drilling where possible. Each of these items significantly reduces emissions. Thank you for the opportunity to submit these comments. I recommend that your process culminate with new rulemaking to formally consider the recommendations from myself and others. Thank you for your time today. And thank you, Mr. Moore. We appreciate you being here and for your uh, well thought out comments. Next, we have John Jenkins. And Mr. Jenkins, I see you're on the panel. Uh, we I can't yes, see you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Please uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is John Jenkins and I am the Chief Officer for the Stonewall Fire Protection District. First off, I would like to thank the COGCC for hearing my testimony. I have served in this rural community on the fire department for 15 years now with the last three years of service as Chief Officer. My district serves 547 square miles 
with four unincorporated communities and 16 landowners associations, a population of around 3,500 residents. Within the district, there are approximately 4,500 coal bed methane wells and only seven fire hydrants. In this rural community, the gas industry is vital to the economy, the school district, and emergency services. I could go on for days on how important the industry is for our community, but today I will focus on the water use for fire services. Uh, with our seven fire hydrants in the district, all of which are located in the center of the district, we have an average of one to one and a half hour turnaround time for water from a fire hydrant. During times of extreme fire behavior, we must utilize any available resources, which in many cases is produced water in pits. This life-saving resource has on many occasions been the only way we have stopped small fires from becoming catastrophic. I understand the concern for the environment and some produced water can be unclean and unsafe to be reused but that is not the case in our situation here in the Raton Basin. Each month, the wells in our areas produce around 85 million barrel, gallons excuse me, of agricultural grade water. This resource can help reduce our response times, our, reduce our cost, and lower our department's carbon footprint. In closing, I would really urge the commission to look at the unfair impacts of a blanket regulation on produced water and, the, and to base the regulations off of current water sampling reports. Thank you for your time. And thank you for being here, Mr. Jenkins. Next, we have Pete Kolbenschlag. Uh, Commissioner Ackerman, I do not see Mr. Kolbenschlag in the meeting. You are in the meeting and could raise your hand, we'll bring you in. Um, next on our list is Chandra Rosenthal. Again, I don't see Chandra Rosenthal in the meeting. Um, just going down our list, Harmony Cummings. I do not see Ms. Cummings in the meeting either. Uh, Blake. She commented at our last meeting, so I suspect that maybe um, she forewent this week. Okay. Blake Beavers, uh, again, I do not see Blake in the meeting. Uh, next is Shauna Oliver, or Shana, forgive me. I do not see Ms. Oliver in the meeting. Uh, moving on to Andrew Kluster. We do have Andrew in the meeting, so we'll bring him in. Give us just a moment. Thank you, Hearings Manager Larson. And if any of those who were mentioned by Ms. Larson are in the meeting, if you could please raise your hand, we'll make sure that you have time. Mr. Kluster, we do see you. And uh, once you unmute, should be able to hear you. And please take it away whenever you're ready. Cool. You can hear me? All right. Yeah, thank you. My name is Andrew Kloster, and I am a certified optical gas imaging demographer and the Colorado Field Advocate with the environmental nonprofit Earthworks. I want to start by thanking the Commission for initiating the stakeholder process and for offering this opportunity for the public to weigh in on how cumulative impact should be considered in permitting. As you may already be aware, in my role with Earthworks, I survey oil and gas facilities in Colorado using an OGI camera, and I notify the Air Pollution Control Division and sometimes COGCC staff when I identify hydrocarbon emissions that could be attributable to noncompliance with air quality regulations. In 2022, I conducted 553 surveys of 383 oil and gas facilities in Colorado, and I notified the division of 135 potential issues on 111 facilities. For context, that means roughly 30% of the facilities I surveyed and about a quarter of my overall surveys resulted in me identifying potential issues. To be clear, not all of these issues were necessarily found to be instances of noncompliance. But a significant number were, and in those instances, many operators reported making repairs or performing maintenance. I share this information today to highlight the simple fact that possible noncompliance with air quality regulations on existing facilities continues to be a pervasive problem in the state of Colorado, despite all of the efforts that have been made to reduce pollution from this industry. I recognize that this agency does not regulate sources of air pollution directly. However, following the passage of SB 181, this agency is tasked with regulating the development and production of oil and gas in a manner that protects public health and the environment. 
Furthermore, in Section 11 of SB 181, this agency was directed to both evaluate and address the potential cumulative impacts of oil and gas development. The cumulative impact of pervasive noncompliance with air quality regulations at oil and gas operations is one of the more significant threats the industry poses to public health and the environment in Colorado, particularly in the front range where air quality has degraded over the last decade and the region is in severe non-attainment of federal ozone standards. Every new oil and gas facility that is permitted by this agency creates potential sources of air pollution that are permitted separately by the Department of Public Health and Environment. And at neither juncture, at either agency, is there true consideration of pre-existing sources of air pollution when approving these permits. This needs to change. Just as the new setback requirements means that operators must take into account pre-existing homes and communities that may be impacted by proximity to a new development, a true evaluation of the cumulative impact of air pollution would mean that operators would have to consider how a new facility may add to the sources of air pollution already present in a community or in our region more broadly. Oil and gas development does not occur in a vacuum. We already recognize this in Colorado as we have passed many new protective rules over the last few years. Accounting for cumulative impacts is long overdue. Thank you again for gathering this input, and I look forward to working with the Commission as we move forward and finally addressing this issue. Thank you for being here, Mr. Kloster. Looks like our next speaker will be David Frank. If you are Mr. Ben Katz, Ms. Rachel Lehman, or Mr. Rick Casey, and you're in the meeting, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we will move to Mr. Frank next. Mr. Frank, it looks like we can see you. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is David Frank, and I am the Energy and Environmental Program Specialist in LGD for the Town of Erie. Uh, thank you very much for having me and for hearing from myself, uh, other members of the public, and several other representatives for the Town of Erie. So Erie supports this Commission's decision to begin what will likely be a lengthy rulemaking process to account for and address cumulative impacts. If additional oil and gas production is to be approved in and near communities such as Erie, it should be only be done once the cumulative effects of current and past production and other impactors are well understood and considered, especially in disproportionately impacted communities as defended, def identified by the State of Colorado's Environmental Justice Act of 2021. Like many communities in the DJ Basin and across the state of Colorado, Erie residents are affected by a host of impacts to their health, well being, and environment, some relating to local oil and gas production as well as many other sources. To accurately account for and assess the cumulative impacts in the community, this commission must solicit data and expertise from all available sources, including your sister state agencies, such as cdph and &E, uh, federal agencies, and where possible, local governments themselves. As you're likely aware, Erie and other communities along the Front Range have invested recently and greatly into collecting robust data regarding air quality. These data should be utilized to assess cumulative impacts in our communities. Accurate modeling and accounting of the myriad emission sources of ozone precursors, greenhouse gases, and air toxics from vehicular and industrial sources, landfill emissions, and emissions from the production and transport of hydrocarbons is essential to, the, to this commission's stated mission to regulate, develop, <coughs> regulate the development and production of natural resources of oil and gas in the state of Colorado in a manner that is protective of, hum, of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. <coughs> in closing, I'd like to say uh, it's, it's critical that you work hand in hand with all available sources of data and rely on the expertise of other agencies in assessing the, the various sources in our communities, um, especially sources such as uh, industrial manufacturing uh, and, and landfills, and to account for the existing emissions uh, in our communities and how those impact our air quality and our ability to uh, comply with the SIP to uh, become in compliance with ozone standards uh, with the EPA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frank. We appreciate you being here with us today. Next, we have Tim Gosa. And Mr. Gosa, it looks like we see you on the panel, although we don't see your video. Uh, you can hear us. If you uh, would like to turn on your video, please do so. Otherwise, you're welcome to unmute and proceed as you're ready. Mr. Gosar, are you with us? We, 
No, it looks like his hand is raised. Uh, we can't hear you. It, do, it looks like you haven't been taken off mute. And so if you've got a mute button, you're able to get off. Try that. Otherwise, we will see if we can work with you. Oh, it looks like you've come off mute. See if we can hear you. We do not hear you, Mr. Dosar. Perhaps we can have uh, somebody work with you and we can continue on, Ms. Larson. Yes, I was going to say we can bring Ms. Schwartz in and then we can um, hopefully get with Mr. Gosar and uh, allow him to come back in. Wonderful. Thank you. So, uh, Alexis Schwartz, please. Ms. Schwartz, we can see you and it uh, looks like you're off mute. Please continue as you're ready. Great. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Alexis Schwartz. I'm the conservation organizer of the Colorado Sierra Club which has over 100,000 members and supporters in the state. I'm speaking today to request that the scope of the cumulative impacts rulemaking include each of the asks made in the Wild Earth Guardians petition, including the creation of rules that would result in denial of permits within areas already experiencing temperature increases that are indicative of disastrous climate change. Pollution from oil and gas development impacts Coloradans, not just at a local level, it has regional and statewide impacts and contributes to the global climate change already impacting Colorado. Industry should be required to use the social cost of greenhouse gases to calculate the societal cost of their operations and include those in their cumulative impacts reports. The COGCC must deny permits of proposed facilities in areas with local warming already above 1.5 degrees Celsius. The COGCC cannot fulfill its legal mandate to protect people, wildlife, and the environment if oil and gas operators are allowed to ignore the most significant environmental and societal problem caused by the industry. Other petition asks we request be included are to create rules that result in denial of oil and gas plans that would create unhealthy levels of pollution or contribute to unhealthy levels of pollution. Plans that would emit large amounts of ozone precursors during ozone season and on high pollution days, and plans that would be located within disproportionately impacted communities. Denial of permits while Colorado is not meeting its greenhouse gas emission reduction obligations. Requiring equity analyses for facilities in or near disproportionately impacted communities. Adopting a definition of cumulative impacts that includes all pollution sources, not just oil and gas sources, such as the definition used by the federal EPA. Penalizing oil and gas operators for inaccurate pollution projections for new wells and establishing a baseline monitoring. This will enable establishment of a level of pollution at which permits for new wells must be denied. We also request that permitting of new plans be paused until the rulemaking can take effect. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Schwartz. We appreciate you being here. Um, were we able to get Mr. Gosar uh, straightened out or do we- Hey, Brian, I've got him on the phone. Um, he's gonna call in in just a minute, but we can go ahead and whoever's next and we'll get him in. And Wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate the update. And so next on our list is Leslie Bluestrom. Uh, Ms. Glustrom has declined to be promoted to a panelist. I'll try one more time. Ms. Glustrom, if you would like to speak, um, please accept the request to become a panelist. Ms. Glustrom's coming in. Great, we see you there, Ms. Lustrum, and uh, looks like we can hear you. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Ackerman and other members of the COGCC. My name is Leslie Glustrum, and I wanna thank you so much for moving forward on this issue. I will note that it's been almost four years since the legislature directed you to do this, so uh, moving with all haste would be good. And I understand that it can be very difficult when on the one hand you hear, oh, don't do anything. We're very dependent on the tax revenues, things like that. And on the other hand, you don't actually hear directly very much from 
the family members and the children and the students and the loved ones who've developed cancer, they can't come here today. As it turns out, I am chemically sensitive. I'm trained as a chemist and a biochemist. There's a, there's a bell curve of sensitivity and I happen to be not at the very end, but pretty close, I'm very sensitive. That means that every day that I spend on the front range is a miserable day. But I'm in my 60s and I can continue to function. Unlike so many school children that go when they're six or eight or 10 or 12 and they're just miserable and how can they function? So I understand that that can be kind of paralyzing to, on the one hand, hear about the economic impact, on the other hand, hear kind of indirectly about the health impact. But the good news here, there's lots of good news. One, the legislature solved that for you. This is not a choice. This never should have been a choice. You were clearly directed to address cumulative impacts almost four years ago. And of all the people that have been made sick, people who've had to move, all of that has been put on hold while the agency has failed to do a direct cumulative impact rulemaking. The other piece of good news is that you have a good starting point. You may not like it, but at least it's something you can put out there with a the petition for rulemaking so that you can at least get started doing what the legislature directed you to do. This is not your choice. This is the law. I'm sympathetic to the difficulty of it, but that's not good enough. Hundreds and thousands of people are suffering. Our air is completely out of compliance and you have a good starting point. So I just wanna encourage you and then personally, every, you know, Every year that we're here, my husband says we have to move because he knows how miserable I am. And every year I say I can't move because I do a lot of work on climate change and energy and all that. So anyways, I want to thank you, commissioners, but this is not a choice. You are mandated to do this. Please move much faster than you have been. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Ms. Glestrom. We appreciate your time as well. Thank you for being here. Next on our list, we have Hillary Suoka. And I assume Ms. Larson, you'll let me know when Mr. Gosar is able to join us by phone. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Suoka. I'm sure you can uh, correct me on the pronunciation of your name. We can see you and it uh, looks like you are off mute. Please continue. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Hilary Suoka. I am the Environmental Programs Coordinator for the Town of Frisco. Here in Frisco, we are concerned about the associated emissions from oil and gas development because of their impacts on climate. Without decisive action, Frisco's future climate could be closer to that of Eagle, Colorado, with hotter summers, warmer winters, and earlier snowmelt. Major consequences of these changes include shorter ski seasons and increased risk of wildfire both in acreage burned and length of wildfire season, which would be detrimental to our community, economy, and the way of life as we know it. I encourage you to consider the ongoing data that is coming from advanced air quality monitoring, health studies of communities enduring large-scale oil and gas development in close proximity to communities, and more accurate measurement of noise. Please use this data to inform your policies or rules for addressing impacts from oil and gas development. The Ozone State Implementation Plan rulemaking that the Air Quality Control Commission conducted last year showed that the development of oil and gas and its uses are by far the largest source of pollution in the Front Range non-attainment area. Pollution affects us all. Cumulative impacts must truly address cumulative sources of pollution. This means not isolating oil and gas emissions, but adding the impacts of those emissions to the impacts of Colorado's ozone levels that cumulatively impact the health of Coloradans, our air, our water, soil, and wildlife. Cumulative impacts must also include oil and gas development's use of trucks that also add greenhouse gas emissions and the impacts to clean water, which is used in great quantities by the oil and gas industry during a time of increasing clean water scarcity. I encourage this commission to carefully define what cumulative means, but also to not spend too much time defining the problem as we don't have time to waste in actively addressing the impacts to immediately improve the health of our state's residents 
and simultaneously doing our part to reduce dangerous greenhouse gases contributing to climate change. Thank you all so much for your time. And thank you, Ms. Suyoka. Thank you for being here. Okay, I've been informed that we are missing our next participant, but uh, that we can move to Leslie Weiss. And I believe uh, Ms. Weiss addressed us in a previous meeting. And so if you have anything to add that you've not already submitted in the previous meeting, we would hear from you now. Hi, can you hear me? We sure can, and we can see you too. Thank you. Hi, yes, um, I haven't yet addressed you. My name is Leslie Weiss. Um, when SB 181 was adopted in 2019, I was happy to participate in the subsequent rulemaking process for over a year. I spent many hours researching and preparing information and testimony that I thought might be useful to COGCC and the state to help make this an impactful law. I participated on behalf of climate and environmental organizations dedicated to making the necessary changes to avert the climate crisis and maintain ours as a livable climate. I also participated on behalf of myself as I have for many years been concerned about climate change and have dedicated hundreds of hours as an activist and even refocused my professional legal career to help technology companies find solutions to displace fossil fuels so that we may and our children may enjoy this planet as um, we have in the past. I even went back to earn a master's at the University of Denver in law from, for environmental natural resource law and policy. Jeff Robbins, Mimi Larson, and other current prior commissioners and staff know me as an active participant. Since then, in 2020, I took a full-time job with an electric vehicle charging technology company. Since the two main contributors to climate warming gases are oil and gas production and combustion and vehicle transportation, I was proud to continue to help in both of these major contributors of emissions that cause warming with the goal of awareness and solutions to reduce those emissions. I worked hard over the past two years to help expand the nation's EV charging infrastructure so that electrical vehicle adoption can be accelerated. We are all aware that methane and carbon dioxide are significant byproducts of oil and gas. Once they're emitted, both remain in the atmosphere for many years. Therefore, they are undoubtedly cumulative impacts that affect our public and health, public health and our environment in Colorado. Why has COGCC essentially failed to continue to do their part? Literally nothing has changed since SB 181 went into effect, other than you have denied one single permit. permit. Yet you have allowed over 4,000 permits. You are the gift that keeps on giving to the oil and gas industry. My family is now in the process of moving out of the front range. The fire in Boulder County last year was the last straw. Summers have become untenable, hotter and more difficult to breathe because of the ozone that is at dangerous non-compliant levels. I don't know what state the speakers live in today who have been telling you there's no need to do anything. It's all being properly handled. That is not true. My family will be staying in Colorado, but I have friends with respiratory issues that have been forced to leave the state. Others continue to live here like Leslie Glustrom while their asthma and respiratory problems are a daily burden to them. I don't know how helpful this testimony is from me, but I felt compelled to express to you that I'm truly disappointed and outraged that COGCC is failing in its duty to protect public health, welfare, and the environment as the law requires you to do. Thank you for this opportunity for me to allow to express this to you. Thank you, Ms. Weiss, and certainly your testimony is very helpful and all points of view are, are very helpful. We appreciate you being here today, and I apologize that I mentioned that you had appeared before. You had signed up at a different meeting, but we did not hear from you before, so thank you for the correction there as well. It looks like we do have uh, Mr. Gosar on the phone now. And so Mr. Gosar, uh, you are muted, it looks like. Oh, it looks like you have unmuted. We should be able to hear you. Please continue. Oh, you're muted again, Mr. Gosar. If you're speaking, we do not hear you at this time. Ms. Larson, perhaps you can help me. Is it star six to unmute on the phone? Oh, unmuted now, I believe. So please try uh, talking, Mr. Gosar. Maybe we can hear you. Unfortunately, we cannot. So we'll continue to work with Mr. Gosar. And we'll uh, go ahead and move on down the list. We apologize for the technical difficulties there. Hopefully we can hear from you, Mr. Gosar. Can you hear me okay? 
oh, we've got you now. Please uh, go ahead. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Good morning, commissioners and everyone. I'm Tim Ghost, our small business owner and longtime resident of Larimer County. My dad was an oil and gas geologist for over 30 years. I was able to work with him for a couple of summers when I was growing up, so I have an understanding of the heavy and sometimes dangerous industrial operation it is. I also understand it's a short-term necessity if it could be done responsibly and safely, which I don't think it is. These cumulative impact stakeholder meetings are good, but shouldn't be in place of clear, comprehensive rules implemented for future permitting. Cumulative impacts include spills by oil and gas operators. PDC, which you just permitted the massive guanilla cap, had 83 spills that it notified you of in 2022, up, up to September 21st. KP Kaufman has had 279, 279 recorded spills since 2020, which are both probably conservative figures. Air quality is another of these important cumulative impacts. The biggest contributor to Larimer County's F-grade air quality by the American Lung Association is from oil and gas, with neighboring Weld County being the biggest source of this. Recently, the North, Northern Front Range was downgraded to being a severe violator of federal air quality standards. There were six, six regions across the United States reclassified as severe, and Colorado had the second highest daily average level of ozone, according to the EPA. Water is another important cumulative impact. The oil and gas industry uses millions and millions of gallons of water in every fracked well. Water for use in the oil and gas industry is removed and destroyed from the hydrological cycle. Information from the COGCC, Department of Natural Resources, report on the evaluation of cumulative impacts stated, only one other OGDP reported using recycled water, a DJ Basin OGDP with 0.5, 0.5% estimate of planned recycled water use. Other OGDPs had none or less than 1% recycled water use. Water shortages persist and will continue to worsen in Colorado and the West, so water use and allocation of it is absolutely vital. I believe this is an underappreciated but critical cumulative impact, especially given the increased population projections moving forward for the northern, northern Front Range in Colorado. Natural gas and oil systems is the fourth largest contributor of total greenhouse gas emissions and the largest contributor of methane. Methane has more than 80 times the warming power of carbon dioxide over the first 20 years. Study after study has concluded that oil and gas is severely underreporting, severely underreporting its methane emissions, and government agencies are underestimating it too. Extensive research led by EDF in a six year period showed that oil and gas emissions of methane in the US are far greater threat than the government estimates suggest, as much as 60% higher than the EPA's estimates, in fact. The wasted gas is enough to fuel 10 million homes for a year. In, oil and, in Colorado, oil and gas contributes to ozone at a rate 1.5 times higher than cars. The COGC is required by law to address cumulative impacts with an overall mandate of protecting public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. Assessing and defining cumulative impacts and implementing stringent enforceable guidelines used to decide to permit or not, or not, needs to be done to, behold, to, to uphold the mandate set forth in Sun, Senate Bill 181. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gosar. I'm glad we were able to get you on and get your testimony. I appreciate you being here uh, by phone with us this morning. Thank you, Hannah, for working with me. Thank Thanks so much. Next, we have uh, Scott Simmons. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the chance to speak on cumulative impacts. My name is Scott Simmons. I live in Weld County. I've been a Colorado resident since 1995. I'm also the co-chair for the Northern Colorado chapter of the Climate Reality Project. The Climate Reality Project is a nonprofit climate advocacy organization consisting of nearly 50,000 trained climate leaders and a membership approaching 1 million volunteers. I wanna provide my comments regarding cumulative impacts. I have two major pads located within 3,000 feet of my house. As of last year, I no longer allow my four-year-old granddaughter to play outside due to air quality issues. Additionally, I do not let her drink tap water at my house. I should note that we have many homes located in this neighborhood within a few hundred feet as a result of reverse setback variances granted to developers. I feel lucky actually that my house is nearly 1500 feet from the closest pad. When 19181 was signed, I was pleased as I thought that we would see greater regulation of the oil and gas industry. However, that change has been very slow in coming. 19181 requires the commission, whenever exercising its authority, to, quote, protect and minimize adverse impacts to public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources, and shall protect against adverse environmental impacts on any air, water, soil, or biological resource resulting in oil and gas operations. Well, unfortunately, we're not even close to doing this. We need better criteria rules and health and environmental standards for negotiating permits and for denying permits that are not adequately productive. So how do we do this? Well, 
First, we need to adopt a definition for cumulative impacts. They need to include air quality, biological resources, biodiversity, greenhouse gas impacts, drought, land use, water use, water quality, public health, public safety. Currently, cumulative impacts are defined and managed on a case-by-case -case basis for each permit. That doesn't work. Additionally, we need to have coordination and consensus between state agencies. Uh, as an example, the COGCC, along with the AQCC and the APD, need to develop very strong air quality requirements, the cumulative impact rules that set maximum thresholds for total air pollution and emission of greenhouse gases and ozone precursors. Finally, we need to provide for honest reporting and follow-up act actions as it relates to all cumulative impacts. We continue to see an underreporting of impacts through the CIDR system that you developed and a poor job of ensuring that follow-up activities are managed to resolve these impacts. In closing, we think that you should pause permitting until you address the cumulative impact rulemaking because permitting inherently produces more cumulative impacts with the development of drilling infrastructure and your rulemaking has not addressed these adequately. We're harming the health of our children as the oil and gas industry seeks to maximize short-term profit, profits without regard for long-term environmental impacts. This reckless behavior needs to stop. The COGCC needs to critically evaluate permits based upon a clear and definitive approach for defining and managing cumulative impacts associated with oil and gas operations. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address my concerns. And thank you, Mr. Simmons. Appreciate you being here with us. It looks like Becky Sorotic has been elevated to panelist. We uh, looks like you're off mute. We don't see you, but we may be able to hear you. Please go ahead. Um, hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. We we sure can. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Hello. My name is Becky Sorotek, and I live in Western Colorado in Garfield County, and I'm a native to Colorado, and I'm a proud industry worker. Um, I want to talk about the prevention of some emit high emitting oil and gas activities during ozone season or high ozone days uh, proposed rule. Uh, my company does what's called midstream. We, are, we work with highly flammable pressurized lines and equipment. Our, pla our, our plants process the gases and liquids that come out of the ground after drilling. Shutting down in our operations on a whim is very dangerous to, to my fellow coworkers and will cause more emissions to vent to the atmosphere. Our primary goal um, for my company is for everyone to go home at the end of the day to their families and not lose primary containment of our, of our uh, plant. My company has worked day and night to implement every rule. We want clean air and water too, but shutting down uh, without proper planning will cause more harm to the environment. Um, my company does a yearly cleaning and maintenance shutdown every year. This, prop, this process prop to properly shut down our plant will take 24 hours and at least six hours to come back online. This is a vulnerable time for my plant and much care and planning needs to be done for this to happen. Um, I'm asking you to think of all the workers who risk their lives every day to make sure that you have heat in your home and, and can go about your daily life as it is. Natural gas is replacing coal as the primary energy source for electricity, which includes charging EVs. Um, have you considered all these rules are doing more harm than good? Um, if you stop operations of oil and gas just because it will cause more emissions and unattended potentially uh, hazardous consequences. Uh, thank you for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Ms. Hrotek. Appreciate your comments here today. Next, we have Marsha Kemen. Ms. Goldsmith Kemen, it looks like we uh, can see that you've been impaneled. We don't see you, and it looks like you are on mute. If you can hear us, we're ready. If you uh, take yourself off mute. We do not hear you yet. You're speaking. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine now. Thank you. Okay, great. My name is Marcia Goldsmith Kamen. My husband and I moved to Aurora just two and a half months ago and are currently residents of South Shore. We left Michigan, Great Lake State, to move to the beautiful state of Colorado. We chose to live right nearby the Aurora Reservoir, allowing us to continue to enjoy a healthy lifestyle in a lake-like atmosphere. 
When we purchased our home, we had no idea that Civitas had proposed a fracking project with well surface locations nearby and subsurface well bore paths underneath our home. My comments will focus on the cumulative impacts on public health. Fracking can expose people to harm from lead, arsenic, and radioactivity brought back to the surface of the land with fracking blowback fluid. Cumulative impacts of lead and water are documented extensively, as I learned living nearby the city of Flint during the Flint water crisis. Without proper monitoring and enforcement of penalties for noncompliance, the residents living with these oil and gas horizontal drilling lines underneath our water sources, homes, and schools will suffer from the health consequences, not just physical health consequences, but mental health as well. I believe the COGCC should undertake your assessment and evaluation of cumulative impacts during the permitting process by looking at it from a human rights perspective too. For the public not to know the exact makeup of all the chemicals used in this fracking process because they are proprietary is totally violating our rights as Colorado residents. We are the ones living with these wells close to and directly underneath our homes. Full disclosure of the chemicals used must be made available for COGCC scrutiny. COGCC needs to employ and adhere to measures to avoid serious and irreversible damage, not only to the environment, but to public health as well. The psychological impact of not knowing the magnitude of the damage that can, concur, can occur is also devastating to all of us. The level of fear and anxiety are causing people to consider fleeing areas to avoid potential exposure. We all look to commissions such as yours to protect us. So now is the time to pause on these permits and gather more robust data to fully evaluate the cumulative impacts during the permitting process. Staffing up COGCC to adequately utilize the expertise of our scientists will help Colorado stand out in the United States as a leader in protecting our public health. Taking time to create a vigorously researched plan of action now will position our state to implement the necessary precautions to avoid having to plug wells at huge costs that pose problems for us in the future. Fracking methods have changed and we need to evaluate the measure of the increased threat to public health thoroughly examining, examining the cumulative impacts of having these wells so close to residential homes and schools. Thank you for following SB 181 rules and holding these cumulative impact stakeholder meetings as you continue through this scoping process to assess issues of cumulative impacts. I implore you to look at the current examples in Colorado and elsewhere to learn from their mistakes. Knowing what can and has gone wrong with fracking Put in safety and monitoring methods now to prevent Colorado residents from living through spills, leaks, contamination, and exposure to toxic chemicals. Your mission is to protect public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. This is the perfect time to seize the moment, set a nationwide example, and avoid public health crisis in our state. Thank you for listening to my comments. I apologize for going over time. And thank you, Ms. goldsmith Kevin. We appreciate your comments here today. Looks like uh, Ms. Hodges is on the panel. Uh, Brandy Hodges is our next speaker. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for hearing my comments today. My name is Brandy Hodges. I'm an environmental health and safety EHS consultant in Greeley, Weld County, Colorado. I've lived in this wonderful community for 26 years now, having moved here from Longmont before that, where I was born and raised. I enjoy hiking our beautiful Colorado Rocky Mountains, paddle boarding on our lakes and rivers, enjoying culture in Denver and in my own neighborhood, NOCO or Northern Colorado and many other things unique to Colorado. I care about our environment and the precious resources we have here in Colorado. Oil and gas has given me opportunities I never thought were possible. Opportunities to work hard and move my way up in a company to eventually own my own home and my own business. I've worked in the oil and gas and construction industry for 15 years now, and I've seen firsthand how it has enabled others to live the American dream just like me. The men and women that I present monthly safety meetings to, interact and engage with in the field, and attend team building events with, I've watched them develop skilled careers that enable them to provide comfortable and stable lives for their families and children. 
I'm a safety professional. I know the stringent standards that exist in Colorado. It's irresponsible to think that if we stop oil and gas production and drilling in Colorado, that it won't be occurring elsewhere. We've all seen energy prices skyrocket this winter. It's important that Colorado citizens avoid listening to short sound bites and actually research the issue and look at the whole picture. I'd like to state for the record, I have no ad adverse health conditions and I have worked closely in the field with oil and gas for 15 years, along with many other friends and family, some having been in the industry for over 40 years. We're not unhealthy. I find the claims that nearby oil and gas production is making children sick highly suspicious since I've lived near it my entire life. It will be me leaving when I have no more work because oil and gas is shut down. We need domestic energy production and Colorado leads a nation in how to do it safely and responsibly. It's something we take pride in that we do this more safely than anywhere else in the world. Consider the global emissions when we don't produce in Colorado. We should be utilizing the fact that we have the highest standards. And by doing this, I think many would be surprised to see achievement of the emissions goals we have set. So is it really best for Colorado to use cumulative, in, cumulative impacts to determine our energy, energy production? What other impacts would these decisions actually have? I urge you, members of the COGCC, to listen to Mr. Eric Kodek's testimony he gave today about real numbers. Please listen to industry professionals like myself who work in this field every single day and not implement the cumulative impacts as written. I really appreciate you hearing all of us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hodges. Appreciate your time this morning. Looks like uh, we'll jump down our list a little bit. Our next speaker is Randolph Grulet. Looks like Randy. Apologize. Mr. Grulet, if you would unmute, um, we will uh, listen to your testimony. How about now? Yeah, we hear you just fine now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Randy Gerlait. I'm a native Coloradoan. Um, I moved into Wild County in 2004. I've uh, been here uh, since I was born. I'm 69 years old and uh, my health is fine. Um, my son uh, has been working in the oil industry for the last 10 years. Uh, about three years ago, uh, he started his own company, which was really a tough time to start a company here in the oil business, but he, uh, he's been, he's been getting through it. It's been tough. A lot of what hurts him is, uh, the oil wells are already shut down a couple of days a week, uh, due to weather or due to well issues, wire line or whatever it might be. So there's a recommendation to maybe shut down the oil wells, uh, during high ozone season would be very difficult for the oil industry and the oil workers. I looked it up and there was 75 high ozone days. Uh, recorded last year uh, in this area. So if you're going to shut it down for all those days, uh, it's going to be a big impact on the salaries of these workers. Uh, we, uh, I appreciate the environmentalists trying to do whatever they can for us, but I don't know. I was thinking maybe we should, instead of just looking at this area, maybe we should look at it from a global aspect. Uh, globally, it looks like uh, if you listen to some of the comments, there's so much quality control being done with the oil industry, so much regulations on it. Maybe at a global, from a global perspective, maybe we should be doing all the drilling. I, I know we import from Venezuela and from OPEC, and I cannot see how Venezuela would have better restrictions, better air quality control uh, for extracting their oil than we do. Um, like I said, the, the, the wells, like I said, are already shut down. And I don't know what we're going to do for all these workers. I hope we're thinking about some way, if we do pass these rules, to uh, come up with uh, some way to subsidize their income. Now, as far as the COGC is concerned, I know you guys are taking slack for not doing your job. I was also on a uh, meeting here in uh, to try and get a permit for a well that was in uh, Firestone. And you guys, uh, I was disappointed that you guys did not allow the permit, but you guys went and looked at it and determined that it was too close to the uh, residential area. So you did not allow the permit. So when it makes sense, you guys do do your job and you do do it. This, this does not make sense to be shutting down the wells during high ozone. Um, thank you for letting me speak. 
Thank you, Mr. Brule. We appreciate you being here. Appreciate your comments. Our next speaker is Mackenzie Smith. Looks like we can see you, Ms. Smith, and uh, please proceed when you're ready. Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Smith, and I'm a production engineer with Evergreen Natural Resources, LLC, which operates CBM wells out of the Raton Basin in Colorado. I'm here today to discuss the beneficial cumulative impacts of the produced water that Evergreen Natural Resources produces. To start, my understanding of cumulative impacts, as since it has not been defined, um, is the evaluation of the impacts of oil and gas operations in the state of Colorado, not only today and tomorrow, but in five, 10, and 20 plus years in the future. We are here to support this rulemaking and provide a different type of perspective to the cumulative impacts rulemaking. As of the end of year 2022, Evergreen produces nearly 90 million gallons of water per month from our 2100 CBM wells. We have compli complied with the COGCC 909J rules and regulations, which require the testing of water quality, which is displaced to pits. To date, we have collected over 500 samples of water quality throughout the field. Here's pre preliminarily what we have found. Evergreen produces nearly 90 million gallons of water per month. The average TDS of this water is 2,469 milligrams per liter. The EPA standard for agricultural consumption is 3,500 milligrams per liter TDS. While not all of our water meets this standard, it is estimated that at least 95% of it does, equating to nearly 85.5 million gallons of water per month produced that could be beneficial for agricultural consumption. The beneficial and positive cumulative impacts of this water need to be evaluated and considered by the commission. To allow this water to be disposed of into downhole disposal wells removes this beneficial source from the ecosystem and environment forever. By disposing of this good quality water, we are therefore creating a negative cumulative impact on the environment and the ecosystem. Examples of the beneficial cumulative impacts that this produced water could have on the state of Colorado includes, but is definitely not limited to, wildfire prevention and mitigation storage ponds for the entire state of Colorado. Can you imagine what 90 million gallons of water a month could do to redu reduce the impact of devastating wildfires in our state? Evergreen appreciates and respects the commission and other participating agencies in its quest to evaluate all of the cumulative impacts from oil and gas operations. We urge you to see both sides of the coin and to consider the beneficial cumulative impacts that this agricultural grade tested and verified produced water could have on the state of Colorado. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Smith, we appreciate it. Next on our list is Barbara Donick. And uh, Commissioner, I do not see Donny uh, Mizani on the, in the meeting. Tisha Ford, oh, there's a hand being raised. Okay, one moment, this may be our next speaker. It looks like the right one. Hi, um, sorry, that took a little bit of time there. Uh, can you all hear me? We sure can, go ahead, please. Okay, yeah, I see I'm still signed in as, uh, my name's Barbara Donakai, and I speak, I'm speaking on behalf of Physicians for Social Responsibility Colorado. And we're an organization of health professionals and allies that um, are advocating to mitigate public exposures to toxic substances, impacts of climate change, and reliance on fossil fuels. So um, first off, I wanted to note that we are in agreement with the Environmental Justice Task Force recommendations that one, cumulative impact analysis should include air, water, soil, radiation, as well as economic burdens, existing non-oil and gas sources, and other factors. Two, agencies should not wait until an environmental equity and cumulative impact analysis is in place to use their authority to avoid and minimize adverse impacts. And three, that a clear and common definition of cumulative impacts be adopted. And I think most of us agree on that, no matter what side of the fence we're on. So I want to briefly point out um, the um, some of the health impacts of toxic air emissions, primarily on children. And these are only ones that are attributable to oil and gas without including 
cumulative impacts. And these are, to me, these are serious enough to merit consider a lot of consideration about permitting. So there'll be more than 32, that's estimated there'll be more than 32,000 summertime asthma attacks in children under the age of 18 due to ozone smog. 71% of children under 18 in Colorado live in counties with unhealthy levels of ozone pollution. Children and young adults in Colorado diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia were up to four and a half times more likely to live in areas with the highest density of wells as compared to those with no wells. Uh, another thing I wanted, I read the um, COGC cumulative impacts report, and I have two questions. Um, suppose that don't need, certainly don't need to be answered now, but I'd like to know how they can be answered. On page 10, there's a chart of emissions per OGDP. It shows that in the denver julesburg Basin, the pre-production emissions of VOCs is five times that of methane emissions, while in the western west slope emissions of methane is 75 times that of VOCs. So that's a huge discrepancy, and it to me it raises questions as to the accuracy of those estimates and, and the accuracy of that reporting. Uh, another is on page nine. Um, one EOGDP location was approved within a disproportionately impact community, and my understanding was that was a base baseline base criteria. And I'm wondering why that in itself would not trigger um, denial of a permit. So uh, going forward, what actions? Yes, please pause permitting until cumulative impacts assessment is complete and initiate the rulemaking process as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donick. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your comments. And certainly we uh, can have further discussion if you'd like to get in touch with us on the points that you've raised. Next, we have Tisha Ford. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Please uh, proceed as you're ready. Fantastic. I am speaking today as a concerned citizen, mother and teacher whose family and students will be directly impacted by the Lowry Cap proposal. I'm not speaking on behalf of Cherry Creek Schools, although I do have correspondence from the board stating their opposition to this project. I've lived in Colorado since 2003 and I absolutely love this state and the beautiful, um, are you, can you still hear me? Yep, we hear you loud. Okay, Thank great. And the beautiful outdoors. And I've loved sharing it with my son. Um, we've been in South Shore for four years now. Um, I feel like all of this is at risk at this point, And here's why. The EPA has reclassified Colorado's front range non-attainment as a severe violator of federal air quality standards. In 2021, we had 65 ozone action days from May 31st to August 31st, the highest number recorded since starting in 2011. Um, the fracking proposed at the Lowry Ranch cap will produce volatile organic compound emissions, which form ozones. This can cause lung damage and premature death. The common air pollutants from drilling and fracking chemicals are linked to, to higher rates of cancers, child leukemia, as has all been stated before. Um, that's from the um, Colorado Fiscal Institute 2023. Additionally, a peer-reviewed Yale study as recently as August 2022 found that living near fracking made small children two to three times more likely to develop leukemia than children not living near wells. How can we possibly justify allowing wells to be located so near to five Cherry Creek schools, my school of employment and my son's elementary school included? On a personal level, my son has epilepsy. This causes him to be especially susceptible to loud noises and stress. Stressful situations have proven to cause more and more intense seizures in my son. This has been heartbreaking to watch and it continues to be heartbreaking to consider the future noise, stress and pollution from those proposed wells and the effect they will have on my son. This is just one story of how an individual family will be impacted. Can you imagine the thousands of other residents near these wells? As Mr. Gosar stated earlier, we need clear and comprehensive rules and a pause on all applications for drilling and fracking until and unless these rules are solidified. While I understand the financial impacts and the needs for the products of the oil and gas industry and I'm sympathetic to the workers' needs for income and employment, more important are the lives of my students and my son. Money should not come before our children. We do not want these near our homes and schools. Please move them to unpopulated areas if they must be permitted. Please follow SB 181 and act toward protecting the public health, safety, and welfare of our residents. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Next, we'll hear from Warren McDonald.
Mr. McDonald, we see your name on our panel, but uh, you are still muted. If you're... Can, can, you, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Good. I, I appreciate being able to talk to you folks. Uh, I didn't prepare anything. I never do. And I, I'd actually kind of forgot about it. But uh, I run a cow-calf operation in Los Animas County. We, uh, we own and lease around 10,000 acres. My family's been here since 1891, 132 years. Great-great-grandfather came over here in a covered wagon on the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, so we've got a little history and we, we know how this ecosystem works for the most part. When, uh, when Evergreen decided they were gonna come in and, and drill wells, I really, really wasn't happy about it. I thought they were gonna, gonna really uh, impact what I did as far as hunting and as far as, as, as running cows. But after we got through it for a few years, shoot, it was, it was, a, it was a win win. They, they drilled a lot of wells, and each one of those wells produced water. So we didn't have to run pipelines, we didn't have to drill water wells. We were able to utilize a lot more of the ground uh, that we owned. So not, not only did the cattle were able to utilize it, but so did the elk, the deer, the bear, the turkeys. So truthfully, since they've been here, our, our elk population was already on the rise, but continued to be on the rise. Uh, the deer were almost non-existent for years. We've got, we've got a tremendous deer herd right now. So I guess one of my biggest issues, and, and I, I'd, I'd hate to be in your guys' seat. You know, I've listened to the pros and cons of this, of this whole discussion, and, uh, and it's tough, man. You guys got some tough decisions. One of the things I, I kind of want to hammer home is we're not Weld County. We're not, we're not the Western Slope. We're Los Animas. We produce clean methane gas. Our water is good water. Even the water that's injected is good water. Uh, like, like the lady said previous, 90 million gallons is what they produce. Because of the rules, they are having to inject half of that. Half of that, we, we, we convert that to acre feet of water. An acre foot of water is an acre a foot deep. That'll irrigate that acre for a year. So 1,550 acre feet of water is what we're putting into the Pierre Shale. When that Pierre Shale surfaces and comes out east of Trinidad, it's toxic. It was toxic before they ever got here. There are drainages out there that it's just not got too much salt in it or too much dissolved solids. It's got, I can't think of the name. It's, it's got, if, if you force cattle or livestock to drink it, they will die. So because this, this water is artificially lifted, we've got all these regulations. That water comes out, runs into the purgatory, runs in and goes all the way to the Gulf. So I just wish that you'd look at this just a little closer before you make these determinations on, on this water. So. I see I've run out of time. I could, I could talk for a long time. I apologize for going over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Thank you for being here. I appreciate the, the comments that you've submitted here today. Next, we'll hear from Karen Salapich. Looks like we see you on panel, but uh, you are muted still. Ms. Lopich, if you're speaking, uh, it shows you as muted still and we can't hear you. Okay, I think I got it. Yep, we hear you now. Okay. Hi, my name is Karen Solopich. I live in Los Animas County. Um, we have uh, produced water on our property and we've used it with our, our cattle and wildlife and, and just about everything that's out here because uh, they everything needs water. Uh, CDPHE permitted discharge points throughout the area, having produced uh, free to the landowners. Any re reliable year, excuse me, year-round source of water. This is a is vital to the local landowners. My husband Gary and I have been running our cattle for 45 years plus, and have experienced the devastation of drought years, which have been the last ones few years has been the worst. And um, 
since God is, this is something that does not have to be experienced again in the area because there is a good source of water that could be used um, to clean this up. Since we have had produced water in the area, we have personally witnessed it being used for wildlife, livestock, and fire mitigation. And it goes on and on, the things that you can use this for. Um, I mean, Evergreen creating the 90 million gallons each month of water for agriculture is just, just unheard of. It'd be awesome to be able to start running that from the North Point up here all the way down to the, to the flats. There have been times when there was uh, only close accessible water for an active wildfire was produced. Uh, water and the fact that it could be used to save property and lives. It has been done wonders for our wildlife. Cameras can be set up and um, we have uh, you know, quite the picture show of all the animals that we've uh, come to our yard when they come to drink. During most drought, we have a uh, significant portion for them. But again, since there has been produced water, this has changed, changed for us and many others. I could honestly talk all day about what I have been producing the water and seeing in the area. It has been amazing. And the thought of losing it and the de destruction that will cause is heartbreaking and stressful for us as landowners and ranchers. We don't want to put a one size fits all in our um, properties. We want them to be, what needs, excuse me, needs to be um, one size fits everything and uh, regulations to do so. Um, I think I messed that up. <laughs> Putting in place one size fits all regulations do not help the landowners in this area who rely on the water and, and face losing it because of a re re regulatory that is not necessary to ensure the quality of this specific water. Please take time to think about the impact of any regulations you put in place and see that the water we have now is good and has been good for local landowners and continues to be vital. Thank you for listening to our concerns and we appreciate, we know you have a lot of work to do and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Solovich. Appreciate uh, your time here today. Next we have Matthew Lafferty. I can see you, Mr. Lafferty. And once you're unmuted, please uh, proceed. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, Larimer County appreciates the opportunity uh, to provide comments on what it hopes will be the start of a cumulative effects of rulemaking. In Larimer County's experience, the statutory and regulatory mandate to evaluate and address cumulative impacts is not occurring with the COGCC uh, decision-making process. The COGCC acknowledged during the mission change rulemaking that additional rulemaking efforts were needed to meet the mandate to evaluate and address cumulative impacts. The statement of basis and purpose of the mission change rulemaking states in four different places that because of their novelty, the implementation of these cumulative impact regulatory standards should be an iterative work and progress process in collaboration with relevant stakeholders. Larimer County appreciates the open and transparent process that is being led by Commissioner Ackerman. All voices should be heard in this process, but Larimer County considers the continued ozone exceedance of the front range and state health crisis that demands swift attention. A few suggestions that would dramatically improve the way the COGCC evaluates and addresses cumulative impacts are as follows. COGCC permits should be reviewed and approved concurrently with air pollution control division permits. The COGCC and the ACPD, APCD sorry, need to establish clearer lines of communication and responsibilities. APCD should have clear direction from the COGCC as to what their responsibilities are to review cumulative impacts and evaluations. APCD should have additional time to review the cumulative impact evaluations. Their review should occur with the first middle prior to the application being deemed complete. 
In the event additional information is needed, the APCD may request that it, uh, additional information, such information must be provided before the application is deemed complete. APCD should be expected to consult on every OGDP within the Denver Metro Northern Front Range non payment area. The APCD and COGCC should establish a NOx and VOC budget for all oil and gas industry within the non-attainment area, at least during peak ozone seasons. Once the budget has been met, additional drilling and hydraulic fracturing may only occur if it's outside of the peak ozone season, or if they use grid-powered drilling and hydraulic fracturing, or if they are able to secure offsets of 1.3 tons for every one ton of criteria of air pollutant. Uh, we have numerous other comments that we will be provided regarding air quality, environmental justice, water quality, and soil reclamation. reclamation. We will submit those with our rule making or our written comments uh, prior to the 24th. Thank you for your time. Thank you for yours as well, Mr. Lafferty, and appreciate your written submittal as well. Appreciate you being here this morning. Our next speaker is Tammy Tamborelli. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Tamborelli. We can hear you just fine. Please uh, proceed when you're ready. Uh, members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. My testimony is in regard to the Raton Basin only. My husband, Brent, and I are fourth generation ranchers in Los Animas County, as well as small business owners. I'm a board member of both the Spanish Peaks Purgatory River Conservation District and the Spanish Peaks Bon Carbo Fire Protection District. In your stakeholder meeting guidelines, it states that it is not the intent of these meetings to debate, discuss, argue for, or refute the merits of any issues raised, but rather to simply, but rather simply to ensure that there is an avenue to raise and describe those issues that are important to you for inclusion in the discussion, along with any substance around the issue that you would like to provide. However, in the very next bullet point, you state that it's not necessary or productive to organize multiple voices to make the same point or to be begin letter writing campaign to support any particular point or is issue. While inevit inevitably some points will be raised by multiple people, all points raised during the process will be analyzed for inclusion in the discussion. I wanna tell you that the reason that you're hearing from so many people as well as hearing the same concerns is because they're real and we live them on a day-to-day -day basis. I wanna ask the commission, how many times have you contacted a rancher a firefighter or chief or a landowner in the Raton Basin and scheduled a face-to-face -face meeting at the firehouse or at the ranch property to see what we're actually talking about. My point is this, we continue to write and testify to you on the importance of the water resource, but you continue down the same road of trying to implement rules of a one size fits all. And that just doesn't work. In fact, as I read the 2021 report on the evaluation of cumulative impacts put out by the COGCC, the report is based on eight locations, none of which is in the Raton Basin. Do you know that the water produced in the Raton Basin is among the highest quality of any CBM project worldwide, not statewide, but worldwide? The water produced is a great benefit to livestock, wildlife, and for fire mitigation. It is 1,030 milligrams per liter under the EPA guidelines for agricultural consumption. It provides year round reliable source for Los Angeles County and our livestock doesn't, glow, doesn't grow, glow in the dark. Um, I mean no disrespect to the commission. I am just passionate about this because it affects our entire region. Whether it is providing a reliable drink for our cows, horses, chickens, and honeybees, providing the elk, deer, and other wildlife with a safe source of water so they don't have to travel across Highway 12 to Trinidad Lake where they will possibly lose their life by heating, being hit by a vehicle. Or maybe even more importantly, providing fire departments with a close source of water to fight fires that will actually give them a chance to save precious land and homes. It makes a lot of difference to us. In closing, I wanna make one more point. Last Thursday at our conservation board meeting, the Natural Resource Conservation Dis uh, Service, or the NRCS, as everybody likes to use acronyms, briefed us about the most current snowpack. 
On January 27th of 2023, the snowpack on Kachara Pass measured 12 inches deep, which contained, they estimate, two inches of water content. I hope this information hits home with you. We are in an extreme situation here in Southern Colorado. I would implore you to make the correct decision and make this water available to all of us that need it and want it. And I really appreciate the opportunity and invite you, any of you to come to the ranch for a visit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tamarelli. I appreciate your comments here today. Looks like our next speaker is on the panel. Ms. Natasha Ledger, we can uh, see you and it looks like we might be able to hear you. So please go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me? We sure can. Wonderful. I'm Natasha Leger. I'm the executive director of Citizens for a Healthy Community. CHC is an impacted citizens group of 1,500 community visionaries based in Paonia, the North Fork Valley on the Western Slope dedicated to protecting its air, water, and food sheds from the impacts of oil and gas development. Over the years, CHC has consistently advocated for clear definitions and denial criteria to achieve the intent of SB 181 to prioritize the protection of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife. CHC represents farmers, vintners, scientists, healthcare providers, businesses, and more. We will be submitting detailed written comments. Therefore, my comments this morning will focus on three key points. First, we were disappointed to see that when this commission decided to pursue a stakeholder process, that it did not state that the Wild Earth Guardians petition, or what I will call the citizens petition, should be the baseline for consideration. While that petition did not address cumulative impacts such as water and wildlife, it did identify critical deficiencies in the rules and recommended regulatory outcomes that impacted communities want to see. We therefore urge you to start this cumulative impacts rulemaking with the citizens petition as the, as the baseline. Second, constraining public comments, the task force or cumulative impacts decision-making to technically and economically feasible is prohibited by 181. Those considerations were expressly deleted from the act. Arbitrarily constraining considerations at the outset will only lead to a meaningless outcome. Instead, this commission should widen its gaze, recognizing its broad authority to protect public health, safety, welfare of the environment and wildlife, and avoid cumulative adverse impacts, which definitely includes climate change. Third, the North Fork Valley and the Western Slope are on the front lines of some of the most extreme warming in the state, impacting water resources, food production, wildfire, public health, vector-borne disease such as West Nile virus, and more. A correlation between oil and gas producing counties and the most extreme warming in the state is alarming. Greenhouse gas emissions are directly related to Colorado's increasing temperatures. 76% of oil and gas producing counties in Colorado, that's 19 of 24 counties, have warmed 1.5 degrees Celsius or more. Half of the oil and gas producing counties in Western Colorado have warmed more than two degrees Celsius. And the re remaining half has already warmed more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. The commission simply cannot ignore this in addressing cumulative impacts. Finally, if this commission is to take this cumulative impacts rulemaking undertaking seriously, then it's time that it start conducting community impact tours the same way it conducts operator tours. And to be clear, a community impact tour is by definition beyond the well pad and not simply a one-way listening session. Thank you for undertaking this challenge and thank you for the time to comment this morning. And thank you, Ms. Leger. We appreciate your comments this morning. Thanks for appearing before us. Our uh, next and final speaker is Joe Evers. Please go ahead, Mr. Evers. Uh, CPHE representatives and members of the public. My name is Joe Evers and I'm the policy manager for Oxy. Thank you for the opportunity to present a few initial comments on the cumulative impact review process that this commission is currently undertaking. Oxy has actively observed the prior listening sessions and keyed in on three important items. These items are that the commission's review of the cumulative impacts will, one, be within the COGCC purview and mission, two, be in compliance with Senate Bill 181, and three, actionable in nature. I'll touch on each of these briefly today and can confirm that Oxy is currently working on drafting substantive written comments on these items that will be provided to the commission by the February 24th submission date. Oxy respectfully requests that this commission continue to allow the current rules to progress 
and if the commission believes any additional information is necessary to address its expectations on how cumulative impacts are evaluated and addressed, then it should consider creating a detailed guidance document similar to those for Rule 309 and 314 consultation with CDPAT, Rule 314 TAP guidance, permitting guidance, and financial assurance guidance. Oxy will provide a proposed framework for what this guidance may contain in our written comments. Based on the current commission regulations and the intense scrutiny of cumulative impacts on each OGDP and CAP application to progress through the commission process, Oxy believes that cumulative impact rulemaking will be premature at this time. With respect to the first item, Colorado regular uh, statute 3460102 provides that the commission has authority to regulate the development and production of oil and gas in the state of Colorado in a manner that protects public health, safety, and welfare, including protection of the environment and wildlife resources, among other things. Along with that, to evaluate and address the potential cumulative impacts of oil and gas development. Since emission change rules were adopted and implemented, the Commission and CDPAT have provided helpful dialogue and engagement on cumulative impact issues and expectations that OXI, along with many other operators, adopted on future OGDP and CAP pilots. Also, the Commission director and staff have been fully compliant with Rule 904 that requires annual updates. These annual reviews are very important and demonstrate the Commission is fulfilling its mission and ensuring that it is continually coordinating with CDPAT as required by law. With respect to the second item, the commission complied with the mandate of Senate Bill 181 when it spent several months conducting its own review, hearing technical testimony from industry, NGOs, citizens, and other stakeholders, and engaging in countless hours of hearings to establish stringent regulations to address cumulative impacts of oil and gas operations. Commission staff evaluate the following aspects of cumulative impacts on new OGDP and CAP activities. Air resource, public health, water resources, terrestrial and aquatic wildlife, soil resources, public welfare, surrounding oil and gas impacts, and other industry impacts. The commission staff will also evaluate an oper operated cumulative impacts plan required under Rule 304. Then, once the oil and gas development plan or CAP has been approved at a hearing by the commission, the commission mandates best management practices, mitigation measures, or conditions of approval that address the potential cumulative impacts from the oil and gas development subject to the respective OGDP plan or CAP. Again, this is why guidance would be helpful in assisting the operators and the public in drafting the commission's review process more fully. Finally, OXI agrees that any result of the commission's review of cumulative impacts as they relate to oil and gas operations must be reasonable and necessary and must also be actionable. At this point, OXI does not believe that additional cumulative impact rules are necessary. OXI is committed to continuing to work with the Commission and stakeholders as this process progresses to ensure that any outcome of the Commission's review is actionable and meets the purposes and intent of the Oil and Gas Conservation Act in Senate Bill 101. Thanks for your time. And thanks for yours as well, Mr. Hebert. We appreciate you being here today. We appreciate all of our speakers as well as all of our participants in uh, helping us get our heads around this issue uh, or continue to get our heads around this issue. Uh, this is a complex issue. Cumulative impacts, as we've heard today, means a lot of things to different people, and it's certainly uh, there are a lot of aspects of this uh, issue uh, that are up for consideration. These initial meetings have been intended to help us get our heads around where you are on this issue, and our path forward is intended to assess the issues that have been raised during these meetings uh, for inclusion in the process, and we intend to refine the next steps once we uh, evaluate all the issues that have been submitted. Again, as I've mentioned before, our intent here is to begin broadly and then become increasingly focused as we narrow down the recommendations that do fit within the purpose of the process. And also, as uh, numerous uh, potential vehicles have been mentioned today, we have not at this point prejudged the outcome of this process, whether it be rulemaking or policy changes or forms or administrative procedure modifications or uh, other uh, implementation vehicles uh, has not been decided at this time. Uh, the, the end intent is to ultimately make recommendations to the commission on how to assess and address cumulative impacts. Easy to say, very hard to do, and uh, appreciate all the impact that's there, all of the uh, input that's been put in today. We do want to encourage further written comments, uh, and uh, remember that there's an opportunity to sign up for potential further participation in the process on the form that we provided online. Our written comment form 
for this stage of the process will officially close at the close of business on February 24th. And as we assess uh, all of the submittals at that point, both written and verbal, uh, we will talk more about the next stage of uh, our stakeholder process. Again, thanks everyone for being here. We appreciate your time and appreciate your interest and your passion and look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. Thanks so much and then we can conclude the meeting.